Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first feature presentation of Wakelet Community Week 2022. And uh, we thought that we'd begin the week with a topic that all of you will be able to appreciate, uh, regardless of the subject that you teach and at what level you teach it. So learning resources are plentiful, right? There's so many different resources to choose from, uh, from across the web. And of course, this can get pretty overwhelming when you're looking to find the very best ones to support your lessons and your activities uh, in the classroom. Well, I am delighted to introduce our uh, first uh, feature presentation speaker who is an expert in the art of curation, a wizard in the skill of cutting through the noise and an absolute maverick when it comes to organizing teaching materials. Uh, Monica Burns is one of the most exciting and committed educators in the community right now. And she's dedicated so much time uh, to help bridge the gap between pedagogy and technology. Uh, Monica's written a number of really awesome books. She runs the uh, Easy EdTech podcast, and she is the author of the amazing Class Tech Tips website. Now, please, throughout the show, uh, as we always do at Community Week, and specifically at Community Week, share your thoughts and your ideas and your questions in the chat box. We want to see what you're thinking. Uh, we want to field your questions. And I'm sure that uh, when there's time at the end, Monica will be able to go through your questions uh, and provide some answers. So right now, I'm going to get my clapperboard here. I would love to welcome Monica to the stage as she makes history as the first feature presenter of Community Week 2022. Action. I hope that wasn't too loud. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be here with you all and just honored to spend time here today to talk about a topic that I love, one that is near and dear to my heart. And I'm sure for all of you, too, if you are here today to jump in to this idea of educators as curators, a role that you are already taking on and shining with and looking at some strategies and favorite tips today. So thank you, everyone, jumping in to the comments there to let me know that you can hear me and see my screen in just a moment here. So hello, hello, everyone, as we get ready to jump into our conversation today. So this topic is educators as curators, the art of saving and presenting learning resources. And if we hadn't had the chance to connect before, I hope we stay connected after today. Uh, my name is Monica. Burns, as you heard, um, I run the blog class tech tips and the easy ed tech podcast. If you haven't checked those out, I'll mention them again before we finish up today. And it's right down here by my name. So you can come and find me and stay connected and send a DM on Twitter or Instagram with a question after today. And if you haven't checked out the blog yet, it's just classtechtips.com. And there's a whole free stuff section at the top of the page. Um, I know I'm always looking for that when I'm visiting new websites or new places. So as a former New York City public school teacher, I was always thinking about this idea of curation, looking for really great content to share with students, things that were timely and relevant and exciting, and of course, connected to our instructional goals, things that I knew kids would be interested and excited about consuming, using as inspiration for their own creations. And as a classroom teacher, I started off like many of you might have too, with an overhead projector and chalk and a chalkboard. Let me know in the comments if those are things that were there when you were starting your teaching career, right? So transparencies, all those things that we don't necessarily use in our vocabulary as frequently as in the past. Transitioning into a school where we went one-to-one -one with devices. So our device of choice at that time, going back more than 10 years ago, um, was iPads, as you can see in this mural that was painted outside of the school building that I worked in. I see some love for uh, chalkboard and transparencies in the comments here too. So you are right there with me. Now today, we are focusing in on this idea of curate and handpicking really great resources. And this is one of 10 essentials that I feature in my book, EdTech Essentials, uh, that came out late last year. 
And even though we're focused on this one, this curate, as our focus for today, I know that you'll find a few other pop into the conversation, whether there's some formative assessment strategies that go along with consuming great resources, whether there's some navigational strategies you might show off to a group of students, and for sure helping them explore the world and different places. So lots of overlap here, but our big one for today is going to look at our role as educators, as curators, and some of my favorite strategies and ways to curate resources. So as we go through today, I hope that you will jump into the comments that you will share lots of different uh, favorites, things that you love, things that one of the resources I might mention reminds you of. So please make it nice and noisy in the comments with all of your favorites and your recommendations. And I'm also going to share some places today for you to jump in, for you to talk a little bit about all of the things that you love and are excited about. So I'm hoping today will feel interactive as you get a chance to share some of your favorites too. So before we talk about our role as curators, educators as curators today, I want us to make sure that we think of students and their roles as consumers. Now, I don't know about you, and I'm not sure what time it is where you are, since I know we have folks joining from all over, but depending on where you are today, what part of your day you are in, you might already have consumed part of a podcast episode. I know I did this morning. You might have read a blog post that someone emailed or texted to you or you saw on Twitter. I know I saw a blog post on LinkedIn that I clicked on already today. So you might have some places that you are already going to consume lots of content and we are not the only ones. Students are consumers too. They might be a reader, a viewer, a listener, of content before they even walk into a classroom and surely throughout their school day as they're consuming content that you have shared with them, a friend has shared with them, or they've stumbled across or searched for themselves in different places. So as students are consuming different types of media this way, we know that that might include tutorials or explainer videos or podcast episodes or articles or ebooks. There is just so many different types of content for students to consume. And you might have a few other favorites to add to this list as the popular types of content that kids consume. But before we jump into what students might come across as a consumer and some of the things that you want to take into consideration as a master curator, uh, continuing our conversation today, I'd love to hear a little bit from you because just like I mentioned that I've listened to a podcast or a chunk of it this morning, a blog post, all those great things, we know students aren't the only ones who are consumers. And I'd love to hear from you. What is the very best piece of content you've consumed this year? What is the best thing? Maybe it's a podcast. Maybe it's a TV show. Maybe it's a book you read. Maybe it is school related or not so school related. I'd love for you to share on a special page that I've set up for us at menti.com. I love this tool because I can use it for free with big groups, <laughs> just like you all. So I'd love to hear from you. What is the best piece of content that you have consumed this year? It could be something you are in the middle of on a streaming station that you love. It could be a podcast that you listen to every Tuesday morning, you name it. Jump into this menti.com, type in the code for today uh, for this first menti activity, and it will give you a space to plug in your responses to let us know what is the very best piece of content uh, that you have consumed this year. And while you do that, I'm going to share my Chrome browser here so that you can see some of the results, and that code will actually go to the very top 
of the new screen. So as I pop over here and share my Chrome browser for you, you'll see that code. Uh, it hasn't disappeared just yet, but it will go right up here to I'll the top to of the screen. No, not me new view. So there we are. Yep, you can see uh, that 58040775. And what I'm going to do here is I'm, I know I'm controlling the scroll a little bit with our big uh, group here. So I'll scroll back and forth and you can see some of the things that people are sharing and I'll get quiet so that you can read some of these too. Look at all of these great recommendations. I had Ashley uh, McBride on my podcast earlier this, um, maybe it was last year actually, to chat about her book. These are looking fantastic. Keep them coming. Lots of great recommendations. Lots of awesome podcasts that you've mentioned here. So many great websites and awesome resources. Some fun Netflix content too, right? Lots of different pieces of content that you might have consumed this year. Um, and in our, um, let's see here. Yeah, so you can see lots of really great things here. We'll keep the scroll down. And what I'll do for us after we finish up today, um, if you don't follow along with me just yet on Twitter, it's just at Class Tech Tips. I will tweet out this nice long, I sometimes call it the messy Mentimeter link on Twitter so that you can find it um, and you can see some of the other things that people are hopefully continuing to add um, even after our time together live today. So thank you everyone for jumping in. Keep them coming. You, of course, could snap a picture or jot down at that Mentimeter code if you want to um, and show off and share just that. So I'm going to jump back over here into our slide deck for today. But of course, you can keep those different resources popping into that Mentimeter space. Awesome. And I know some people added some things in the comments there too. Always a great um, place to share. Yeah. So as we're talking about this big idea of curate today, it may be one that is in your everyday vocabulary or your everyday conversation, or maybe you are curating lots of great resources, but you don't always use this word to describe it. Well, when I think of the word curate, the very first thing that comes to mind is a space that looks like this one. A museum curator is the first thing I think of when I think of a role of curating. A museum curator has to make some really tough decisions. They have to decide of all the artifacts in the archive, of all the pieces of artwork they have access to, what are they going to put on the walls or in a display case in a room. And a curator isn't just putting things in different places just because they're making some decisions. They they want to take the person who enters that physical space on a journey. They want to show them connections between different pieces of art or show a timeline in history with different artifacts. They are coming in with a big intention. And even if some pretty cool stuff has to stay in the basement or in the archives, they've chosen the things that are really connected to their goal. What they want to make sure they get across to their audience, the patrons, patrons, the museum visitors, in the same way you are curating content and you are making those decisions of what is really, truly the best resource for students to help accomplish a particular goal. So when educators, when we take on this role of curators, we're doing a few different things. 
we are searching for content and I'll share some favorite search strategies with us as we move through today. We are evaluating content, making sure it is the very best, highest quality, perfect fit connected to our learning goals. We're organizing content, making sure it's easy for someone to figure out exactly where to go at different times or what to go explore. And I bet you can guess that Wakelet plays a really big part in organizing and then sharing content that you might curate or handpick for a group of students. Now, there are so many places to go online, and if you've ever done a big, broad Google or YouTube search, you know there is just so much out there to explore. You might have a favorite YouTube channel. You might have a favorite place to go for videos or for articles or other favorite pieces of content. And you might even have some strategies for helping remember exactly where to go. You might subscribe to a favorite YouTube channel. You might make an appointment. A little reminder on your calendar to go check to see if that favorite resource has new stuff that they've added. So you might have some favorites and strategies already. And today we're going to look at 10 quick tips to consider with a bunch of my favorites popped and peppered in to this list of 10 and some strategies for how you can organize and share great content with your students. So the very first piece of um, advice or strategy to consider on our list is to think of content in categories. There is so much out there and available and to help us narrow our search and make sure we're prevent, uh, presenting a diverse uh, set of content for students, we can think of content in three core categories, in video, audio, and text. Now, I'm hoping that you're pushing back a little bit on me here and saying, Monica, some of this overlaps. Some text content has a read aloud button for audio, or some of the content I share, like an interactive field trip, might not exactly fit into one of these categories. And you are absolutely right. So as we think about these categories, we're thinking kind of broad just to get us started as buckets of content that you may want to circle back to and also say to yourself, am I sharing a good amount of video? Do I have some audio or text options for students? And to think of content in categories this way. One of my favorite categories that sometimes doesn't get as much love as the others is audio content. And this is a quick screen video that I'm playing here, screen share video right from within my keynote presentation. And I'm curious, and you can let us know in the comments, do you share podcasts with students? Do you have a favorite podcast? Uh, let us know in the comments there. So here is a, one of the ways that I love to share podcasts with other people, and that is using the tool Google Podcasts. Not only is it a great way for you to type in a search word, it's Google, right? Um, and search for different types of um, content, but you can also access a podcast player that doesn't even require kids to sign in or anyone to sign in if you are sharing this content with families or colleagues. So of course you could sign in or have your account and subscribe or follow along with a few podcasts, but this will allow you to access a podcast player from anywhere on the web, press play. You can even practice speeding things up or slowing things down and sharing other navigational strategies with students as you explore this type of content. So one of my favorites is to use this and you don't need a Google account to access this. You can see my little avatar in the corner, but you don't have to sign in, meaning it's a great option for sharing a link, posting it in a place like Wakelet or in Seesaw or someplace where someone might not have a login to a lot of other things and they can click and they can press play and they can listen. If you haven't been there before, it's a really great option um, and it's a nice one to have in a blended learning station or someplace where you don't want kids signing into another type of podcast platform that might require them to have an email. So our first tip on the list is to think of content in categories to help us get our wheels spinning to make sure we have a nice balance. And one of my favorite audio examples is Google Podcasts, where you can access all of the same podcasts you would on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts or on Stitcher or another favorite podcast player.
Our second strategy on the list is to reflect on your go-to resources. What are those resources that you come back to over and over over the course of the school year? Now, I don't want you to not come back to them over and over, but when you do come back to them over and over, I want you to think about the ways you might recommend it to someone else the next time you pull it up or to think about why you love that resource so much because it might help you find something else that's just as engaging, that's just as exciting and help you brainstorm a little bit of other things that you might search for. So if you have a favorite go-to resource, of course, you can share it in the chat there and let other people know. One of my favorites is TED-Ed. This is definitely on my list of go-to resources that I come back to over and over again. It is an absolute favorite. Now, TED Ed, if you haven't been there before, is from the same folks that make TED Talks, those awesome 10, 15, 20 minute talks where an expert in the field jumps on a stage and gets you really excited or curious or thinking differently about a particular topic. Well, TED Ed has animated videos that are wonderful, and some of them might make your middle school or high school students giggle a little bit, but all of them are very informative. And if you go to their website and do a quick search, or you head to their YouTube channel where you'll find them too, you can see all of the different things here on the site. So I'm going to go ahead and show you what one of these looks like so that you can get a feel for what it looks like in action. We're not going to watch um, the whole thing. Um, I just want you to get a feel for what's out there and available. Think of all the food made in the world each year. Hard to picture? Then imagine that you are all of humanity and on a plate in front of you is the one lovely annual meal you make for yourself. You did all sorts of work putting that meal on your table. You must be eager to consume the fruits of your labor and the vegetables and meats and waffles of your labor too, right? Well, oddly enough, a third of that meal ends up in the trash. A third of the food we eat globally, an estimated 1.3 billion tons ends up as waste. All the work we put into producing that food is wasted. And what's worse, it costs us. America alone spends an estimated $165 billion a year managing food waste. We're wasting food, energy, and money. Perhaps worst of all, we're wasting the chance to change, to make the system of food consumption more efficient. If you want to bring on that change, you should know about a humble yet diligent and ever so crucial ally, the worm. Worms convert organic waste and other compostable products into natural fertilizers. Up to 75% of what we put in the waste stream can become food and bedding material for vermicomposting. You can create a worm bin in your own home to see the composting process in action. First off, you need worms, and not your typical earthworms. You need red worms, Isenia foetida, the species responsible for most vermicomposting in North America. These red wigglers are surface dwellers who don't burrow too deep. They're optimal feeders around room temperature, and they're well suited to converting organic waste into usable fertilizer. Now, your worms might be vermin, but they need a comfortable space to live and work some bedding material, either shredded paper or cardboard, some moisture, and of course, food. Namely, your leftovers, slightly decomposed table scraps. The worms break down food waste and other organic matter into castings, a fancy synonym for worm poop. Their excrement is absolutely so I'm going to pause it right there for us because I love this visual. If you've ever done composting with a group of students, I composted in my classroom for a couple years and this visual of a worm poop <laughs> is a really great way to help explain composting to a group of elementary school students or people of um, any age. And I will tell you, it is not a smelly classroom activity for as much as it might be here. <laughs> it might look like here on the screen. But what I love about this piece, what I love about this resource is that it is a great one for helping students visualize concepts for let's pause and replay or did everyone catch that or bringing different vocabulary to life. So your intention when you come back and come back to a go-to resource might be some of the things that you've seen already, might be some of the things that you have had students um, respond to really well that you want to bring back to. 
You might also have a favorite podcast that you love to share. Another highly engaging one is Wow in the World. Um, Guy Raz, who's a popular podcaster, um, you might be familiar with the How I Built This uh, podcast, um, which I know I love as an adult listener. Uh, this is one that's created for students. Um, what I like about this is, of course, you could play it straight from Google Podcasts, but if you look down here towards the bottom of the screen, there's also a download button. So you might have a go-to resource that you love because you can have students view it offline. They might all hit download um, to that podcast before they leave school at the end of the day, and it's saved to their device so they can listen to it on the go or without Wi-Fi. So as we continue to move through our list, I would love for you to jump into the comments here and share some of your go-to resources. I've shared a couple already that are on my list, but if you have some that you keep coming back to that are your total favorites, keep adding them to the comments and kind of building our comment role today. So someone who's just jumping in or who joins us, uh, joins in for a recording after the fact can scroll through and see all of the things that you love and are super excited about like me too. Now, number three on our list is to choose content based on learning goals. Now, this might seem like the starting point for a lot of the content that you choose for students, but I think it's important to mention on our list and come back to your why. Why are you choosing this particular piece of content and introducing it at a certain time? So you might use questions like, what do you want students to know and be able to do? Or based on formative assessment data, where do students need additional support? Or how can I choose resources that respond to differentiated instruction needs? These might all be questions that you use to connect the content you choose to the learning goals that you have established, that you know is already taking place. So this might connect to your intention, right? We are reading this article because, or after you finish, you will. And you may set some of these intentions alongside the resources that you pick for students. You might put a guiding or discussion question next to a link that you put into a Wakelet collection. You might have a discussion question on a piece of paper where students scan a QR code, read an article, and then jot down some of their ideas before doing a turn-in talk. Or you might even use a tool that allows you to embed um, questions. So you might have something that you are sharing um, like a favorite video. I know I love the 360 videos um, on YouTube. You might plug this video into a space like Edpuzzle and place some of those intentional questions connected to your learning goal right within a piece of content that you have picked out uh, for students that you've curated for them. So there's lots of ways to be strategic about the types of content that you are picking out for students, the types of things that you want them to see, and of course, the what you want them to do with it when they get there. And you, of course, can let us know. I know if you are watching here on YouTube, you might have a favorite video or you might have a favorite channel channel that you come back to that you can let us know about too. Number four on our list is to select content that builds background knowledge. Now, there are always going to be situations when we walk into a conversation and we just, we don't know the backstory. We don't know what was going on beforehand, and we might not even have the vocabulary to have an informed conversation about that topic. And the same thing goes for students. We want to make sure they are just as prepared as the child sitting next to them, that they are ready to go into a deep dive conversation on a topic. And we can do this by pulling out content that will help build their background knowledge, help provide some context, and maybe even increase their vocabulary around a content. So you might bring questions into your own planning or your planning with colleagues like, what will students need so they can make meaning of your course content? 
Or what experiences have students had that I can build upon? Or what have your observations and conversations with students shown you? So these are all the types of things that might come into play as you are thinking about what you want to pick and choose and share with different students. So all of these might be things that you bring into your own conversations with your colleagues as you are making plans or that you are thinking about as you are setting up students for success. So there are lots of favorite resources that help build background knowledge. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to switch my screen over and show you Google Arts and Culture on the web. I'm a big fan of this resource as a place to transport students to. Airpano is another one. There's ads on this site, so it's not top of my list, but I like mentioning it because it does have some really high quality panorama and video content. And even something like YouTube, where you might do a search for 360 content where kids can spin around and look around in different places. So I'm going to take us out and share um, some of the strategies for exploring Google arts and culture and doing a YouTube search for finding great content. And I'm hoping that as I'm taking you out, you'll think a little bit about a place that you might want students to explore because I'm going to ask you to share um, in a little bit here. So let me go ahead and switch over my screen from you so that you can pop out here on the web with me. So I'm over here first on YouTube, a favorite for me. So you might search for something up here in the top. I already did a quick search for Coral Reef right here to show you on YouTube. And if you haven't played around with the filters, this is a great way to curate perfect content for your students. And sometimes we know, I know I get caught up in just doing the quick search and seeing what pops up, but you can get really specific with your filters, which is an important curation strategy. So you might look for something that's time sensitive, especially if you're looking for current events content, you might look for something that's short, although you can always clip a YouTube video or start it a little bit later. So I try not to get caught up too much in the duration. You might look at different features. So you might look for something like a 360 piece of content, and this will show you content that you can move back and forth as you search. Lots of great ones to explore here um, when you're looking in different places um, for different types of content. Now, I mentioned Edpuzzle before. You, of course, could take a video. I'm going to show you some of my content here, like my 360 content, plop it in here and put in those questions as you move through. So helping kids build background knowledge, but having that intention that goes along with it. Or you might head straight to a place like Google Arts and Culture. I see a lot of love for Google Arts and Culture in the comments already. This is one of my favorite resources. And every time I go there, it looks a little bit different. So you can search through, see all the new things that they are sharing. If you haven't checked out the museum views, this is where we're heading next. They spotlight a whole bunch down here. And if I go to the search bar and I type in something like Grand Canyon, It'll search for all sorts of content related to the Grand Canyon. I can go ahead and search all these different museum views. Um, this kind of reminds you, it might remind you of Google Maps, where I can move around in different directions. I can move my way down the trail. Now, it's not a replacement for the real thing. Like, go to the Grand Canyon, take that field trip, a thousand percent, right? But if you want to build background knowledge for students who maybe weren't able to go on that field trip or weren't able to go to a specific place in the year past or have not had a similar experience to their peers or their classmates, this is a really great option too. So I'm a big fan of this one and would love to hear from you. And this might come back to some of the content you're making decisions about. What places do you want your students to explore? If you headed over to YouTube for a 360 search, or if you went to Google Arts and Culture or another favorite 360 resource, are there places that you would want your students to explore. Here's the code right here at the top, 76029696. Go ahead and tell us a couple places that you might want students to explore.
Now, as you might be able to tell, we are about to create a word cloud. So if a bunch of people put in the same places, maybe you also have the Grand Canyon on your re on your list or coral reefs on your list, um, those words will get a little bit bigger. This looks awesome. Keep it going. So the ocean and space are two on our list that are a little more popular, a little bit larger, but I love these others that are popping in here. Different ranches or farms, stadiums, museums, Alice Island. Awesome. Keep them coming. So just like I mentioned before, I will tweet out this link so that you can see on the word cloud after we finish up today. So if you follow along here on Twitter, um, you'll see some of the things that I'm going to share out following, including some of these word clouds. So keep them coming. I'm going to switch back my screen to our slide deck for today and take you through a few more of these tips on our list as we uh, think about our role as a curator here. So here we go. There we are. Yeah. So as I mentioned, right, you are thinking through the intention here and looking at background knowledge might be one area that you are focused in on or you're thinking about. Number five on our list is to examine representation and resources. As you're curating resources and picking out your favorite things, you want to make sure students see themselves and hear themselves in the resources that you pick. Do all of the speakers and the videos you share look or sound the same? Do all of the writers of the articles you share have the same background? Well, it's an opportunity to be reflective and examine representation in the resources you share share. So you might head to a place that has a big library to pick and choose from, like Epic. Epic has tens of thousands of books that you can explore to create collections that have diverse voices and lots of different um, perspectives represented. represented. Uh, you might also take a look at a podcast like Circle Round. They take a spin on traditional folk tales and have different people share um, their perspectives, uh, read aloud. They make some changes to make things more inclusive. So a really great resource if you are committed to this idea of having better representation, more diverse voices in the resources that you are curating and handpicking for your students. Number six on our tip on the list is to choose content that extends a lesson. So building background knowledge is so important. That was our tip number four, but extending the lesson is crucial here too. So you might ask questions like, what areas may you not get a chance to cover in your traditional lessons? Or what cross-curricular connections would you like students to see? Or what content can students explore after a unit or lesson is finished? And that might bring you out to a space like Newzella, where you know that your students have been so excited about everything you've read about sharks in your unit on oceans. And you don't want to stop the party right there. You want kids to continue to dive into something that they're really excited about, you might decide that in your next unit, even if you are writing about informational writing or reading informational text, and it has nothing to do with the oceans, that you're just pulling lots of examples that help extend that original lesson or that original unit of study. And that brings us into the next tip here. 
number seven on the list, which is to take student interest into consideration. What is it that kids are excited about? What are they talking about? That's a great starting place if you're not sure where to start when curating resources for a new topic. So imagine you're about to kick off that unit on different places in the world. You have a whole unit set up in social studies where you're going to take kids and introduce them to different continents and different countries and different places within the world. Well, if you're not sure where to start, you might ask students, where do you want to travel to? Or which place would you like to go to first if you could buy a plane ticket anywhere? And that can help you make decisions on where to get started as you're searching and sorting through different type of content. So you might ask questions like, what did students show an interest in during the unit or lesson? Or what additional video clips or podcast episodes would grab their attention? Or what subtopics can you gather resources on to help students dive deeper? Now, when it comes to student interest, you might create a Microsoft form a Google form. You might ask kids to jot down on a sticky note what they want to learn more about. But if you're like me, sometimes you don't know where to start, right? Or if your students don't know what they don't know, you might give them some different choices first, like everyone choose one of four, or you might do a scale activity uh, with them. So taking student interest in consideration can take many forms. Now, number eight on our list is so important. If you have all of these things that you found, your intention is super duper clear. You need to have a plan on organizing this content and getting it in the hands of students. Now, if you are here today, you already know how fantastic Wakelet is for organizing resources, for pulling them all together in one place to make it really easy to share. So I'm going to take you back out onto the web. I think this might be my last time switching our screen over for today. We'll see. There might be a few other things to show off depending on any questions that come through. But I'm going to switch back over here and show you some of the things that come to mind for me when I am getting ready to create a collection. So let's go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and switch over here so that you can see my Chrome browser again. Awesome. Thank you. So you can see I use Wakelet all the time and you're here today together with me um, live. So many of you, I'm going to go ahead and create a collection. Now imagine that I am getting ready to kick off a new unit of study all about the Grand Canyon. We're going to talk about the Grand Canyon. I want kids to get comfortable wrapping their head around how big and massive it is, and maybe even some of the animals that live there. So that might be my intention, right? So my collection might be something like Grand Canyon resources, and the description might be student facing. If I'm going to share this with them and I want them to take action on this list of resources that I've curated, I might have a short description that says, in the week before we kick off this new unit, explore these resources to learn about the Grand Canyon. I might get a little bit more specific, like I might say, choose a favorite or come back to class ready for a discussion or something like that. For today, we'll keep it a little bit broad. You already know that I could customize this in different ways, add all sorts of images, really make it pop, of course. But when it comes to the curation piece, I've already picked a few things that I want to share. I'm going to do my control C there, and I'm going to paste this right here into my list of resources. Of course, I could put an action item for students here. I could change up the thumbnail if I wanted to. I might want them to go explore the National Park Service website site. So I could go ahead and drop this in here. I'm going to add this in here for them. I might have this great video on the Grand Canyon that I found from National Geographic. I might share the link here, copy this here, and paste it in. 
So building out these collections can be so intentional when you take the strategies that we've looked at already in mind. And I know that you're here because you are excited about Wakelet too and all the different ways that you can share, that you might invite another collaborator in, like a partner teacher to jump in and share within a collection that you're building. So just so much that you can do when you're setting up students for success when it comes to picking out these very best resources. So I'm going to pop back over here to my slide deck one last time. Let's go ahead and pop it up here. So of course, for you having that plan for organizing content, you might pop everything into Wakelet as you're building out your collection or after you have chosen a few of your favorites, maybe your top 10 that you're going to put in this collection, having that plan for organizing content might be what you take on as your next step. Now, you might also have to make some decisions on the best way to distribute content or get it in the hands of students. Now, you saw me with that quick screen share um, tap on the share button within Wakelet, you might drop that link to a collection in a space that your kids already live in and use as their hub or central spot. I sometimes use the phrase, and if you've listened to my podcast, you've probably heard me say this before, embrace your place. <laughs> so if you have a learning management system like an LMS that you always use, you might pop that collection right in there for students to find. You might connect it to a QR code. You might share that collection of resources in a family newsletter. And of course, you want to make sure, Wakelet's a great example of this, that you're tool for your collection and then all the other things in your collection and Google tools like YouTube videos work well for this too, are going to be friendly for whatever device that you have, whatever device it is that you are going to, um, your students or your family are going to use to access that content. So I've got a bonus tip for us, but number 10 is to curate with your colleagues. Now, if you are working with other people who are teaching the same content as you, you might sit down at the start of a department or team meeting or grade level meeting. You might open up that wakelet that you created before the meeting and say to everyone, hey, here's the code. I'd love for you to jump in and share the favorite resources that you used during the unit last year. Or maybe in the middle of the unit, you might say, oh, we've got a meeting today. I made this wakelet. Would love for you to jump in while we're talking about this other thing and drop in some of your favorite links or things that your students loved. So curating with your colleagues can take many forms. I love setting up a collection, inviting other people in, and then giving them uh, some time to put in their favorite things, whether they annotate it and add in a few notes on why they loved it so much, or whether they um, just drop in a couple links and then you get to explore a bit later. Now, before we jump into our Q&A, our bonus uh, curation tip here, we we're talking about educators as curators today, but you, of course, have an awesome opportunity to help students become curators too. You can model your thinking for them and say, I chose this because, or there's lots of great videos about this, but I knew this was the one I wanted to share with you because, right, and talk through your thought process the same way that you might read aloud a book to a group of fourth graders and let them see you unpacking or thinking about the book that you've read. You can help students understand your own strategies for why you chose a great resource or why you brought something into them and why it's worth their time and how you evaluated that source to make sure it was going to be just right for them. So on days like today where I share lots of different tips, I always say something that might sound a little silly, which is don't do all the things. <laughs> don't do all 10 things on this list tomorrow. Do not try all of these favorites that I shared with you this week. Instead, make a choice on how you want to take action. Maybe this week you're going to open up a Wakelet collection and invite just one colleague to join in with you. Maybe this month you're going to jump back into a go-to resource that you totally forgot about and go in and find some great videos for this upcoming school year. And maybe Maybe this year you're really committed to bringing kids into the conversation and modeling for them how you pick and choose great resources. So totally up to you on how you might decide. 
to share some of these resources. Now, I would love to stay connected with you after today. And as we get ready for that Q&A, would love for you to take a look at my blog, Class Tech Tips. I send out a newsletter every week with a whole bunch of my curated favorites every week. I do the same thing on my podcast. A new episode just went live this morning with two special guests. And if you didn't get a chance just yet to say hello on Twitter or Instagram, um, you can find me on both places at Class Tech Tips. I'm usually a little bit quicker to respond to a message on Instagram, but if you are on any of the spaces, would love to stay connected with you after today as you continue to curate, find new wonderful things, and let everyone else know as you share in those social spaces too. So I will turn it over for any questions uh, that you have, for anything that you are wondering or curious about. Would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for that, Monica. That was super inspiring. And I think that on behalf of like everybody watching, seeing how you brought it all together at the end with Wakelet was particularly exciting. <laughs> um, it was really good to see because quite often we just sort of show Wakelet off with what it can do. And um, we don't we don't usually have the time to kind of go into the the details as in you know how important it is to um, evaluate sources and find them in the right places and that we usually just sort of jump right into you know this is how you add your resource to collections. So it was really, really refreshing to see that. Um, I have a question uh, which is on the evaluating uh, content. So um, I think that that's a step which which quite often uh, we don't think about, right? Like we just look at here's a learning resource and I'm just going to save it to my folder, I'm going to save it to my Wakelet collection, I'm going to save it to whatever. Um, how important is that evaluation step and what sort of techniques and tips would you, would you suggest uh, to evaluate stuff in a good way? Yeah, there's a lot of things to consider. One are some of the big things, right, that we all do when we navigate spaces ourselves, right, which is, is this a trusted source? Is this information that comes from a place right. that I know is going to be great, right? So all of those pieces that we do ourselves, we're bringing in here. Other things that you want to take into consideration when evaluating sources is, is this going to be accessible and friendly for all of my students, right? Does this video have captions? Because even if I don't have, uh, even if there's no I IEP or mandate for a particular student to have that as an option, I know it's useful for a lot of students, whether they can tell you that or not, right? So you might look at accessibility features. You're going to want to make sure it works on whatever device. So if I'm here on my MacBook and I find a really great video, but all of my students are using Chromebooks or iPads, I want to make sure it's going to work there too. So there's a lot of things that you can take into consideration. Every learning environment is a little bit different, and you might have have a couple things on your personal checklist and then kind of keep your eyes and ears open, listen to see where there might be roadblocks or where students might not really understand something as they're going through and then take that into your next round of evaluating content. And again, the, you know, these are things which um, we don't necessarily uh, think about. Like we have to kind of train ourselves to take those things mm -hmm. into uh, account when we're choosing to share those resources. Uh, I think particularly with accessibility, I think that that's super, super important. You know, I think that I think that we're coming to a really great place right now in edtech where like accessibility is becoming um, no longer just like a, a buzzword and no longer like a yeah. bonus. It has to be mm -hmm. baked into, into everything. So um, I think that you know, again, that's that's another another list of things which which people do need to consider when choosing the resources. I particularly loved your, um, and I know that everybody in the chat did as well. Uh, the analogy you made to being a curator in a museum. Um, you know, that's 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 uh, an image which I've used a number of times before in explaining Wakelet. And I think that one of the reasons why that's so powerful is this idea of somebody taking lots of disjointed. Uh, resources or disjointed artifacts in a museum's case and putting them all together in a way that tells a story. Um, do you have any thoughts on the idea and the power of storytelling through those resources? And is it important or is it just a bonus for a teacher to kind of collect resources and put them in a way that adds context and in a way that they know is going to be able to tell a bit of a story, kind of like what we've done with your presentation today? <laughs> Yeah, so there's definitely things that you want to take into consideration. Sometimes you just want to give kids three things to pick from and go and explore, right? But other times you really want them to move through a journey with you. And the same way you might walk into a museum space and you turn that corner into the new room. And if you say, I don't get it, 
like what's the thread here, right? Why are all these things together? Or you walk in and you miss the sign on the wall that explained to you, like with a connection between these things, right? Like you might put your own sign on the wall, right? At the top of your collection to say, this is why I put these together. Or today it's going to be important that you look at these things in the order that I put them in the collection. Some days it's great to just go out and explore. So I think it comes back to that intention and your why. And we might know, right? Like, well, of course I chose this for this reason, or of course, this is why this is here. Or I always share this resource and everyone loves it, right? But if we don't provide that context, it can be hard for students to connect the dots, right? And have that extra piece. So that might be in Wakelet having a quick, concise intro to say, this is why, this is our intention. Or you might even go into the individual resource and change up the description. And instead of giving a summary or what it is, you might say, I chose this because, or we're going to look at this because, or I think you'll like this because, or don't forget to notice this, right? And you might have your cheat sheet of sentence starters that go along with your descriptor of resources. Yeah, the the context is so important. Um, You know, there's, I remember seeing like this really old, very grainy black and white photograph of like just a, uh, it was like looking out of a window at this old street. And, um, you know, it just looks like a really bad quality, like picture from, you know, the 1900s or whatever. But then you read the caption and it's like, this is the first photograph ever taken. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, you know, there's such a deep relationship between the actual resource and the actual uh, content itself. And then the context that you provide for it. And and on that note, I think that one of the things that um, everybody was really intrigued about Uh, because you are an expert in this field is I think that when you shared the platforms through which people can get this content that's that's Mm -hmm. awesome and I think that those platforms are super useful are there any particular channels or pages or um, websites or blogs Uh, I'm sure that there's like literally hundreds in your brain right now but maybe if there's like you know even just one or two uh, that you would recommend as as you know this is this is a great place for you to start your uh, your curation journey as an educator. What would they what would they be aside from your yeah. own uh, blog, of course, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, right. Like I share a whole bunch on my blog, class tech tips, and the podcast, of course, too. But if you are going to a space and you're looking for high quality content, one thing that you may want to consider, and you might have noticed this when I went um, out on YouTube, right? You can search by channels, so you can search for a channel that is from a vetted, high quality resource and if you're not sure where to start for that, like I love ones that have been around for a while that I've interacted with in different mediums, right? Like National Geographic or Discovery Education, right? So there's places like that where I might have watched the Smithsonian channel in the past, or I might have looked at history um, channel on my television, you know, a long time ago. Well, now I'm going to pop over on their YouTube channel to see what is there. So those are some of my favorites to go to are resources that I've interacted with in one medium like print, and then looking to see what they have as a video or podcast format. It takes that evaluation piece, like it helps me get to that step and it helps me make sure that that content's really vetted and useful. Awesome stuff. And I'm just looking at the time because we just, we, it looks like we've gone, we have gone over, but there were two little things that, well, not two little things, but there were two quite significant things that I wanted to just make a comment on beforehand, uh, just before we wrap up. And the first is the idea of uh, using filters and using advanced searches uh, within these platforms that you've spoken about. Like when you discover the advanced search feature on Twitter, for example, like it changes the game, you know, all of a sudden you can, you can look back at, you know, what, what, what was going on uh, and, and, you know, what people were tweeting about, uh, you know, years ago. And that, that's, that's fascinating. And I think that uh, when students discover this as well, uh, they, they, that tends to add a bit, of, a bit more richness to their research um, because they're no longer living in just the now, the immediate, the, you know, if it didn't happen 10 minutes ago, then it's not worth looking at type of vibe. So I, I love that emphasis. And then uh, lastly was, um, the idea of like choosing your student, like allowing your students and empowering them to have that student interest as well. Right. So Mm -hmm. um, finding, finding out what it is that they are interested in pursuing and offering them that element of choice, offering them a selection of topics that they can go in. Each one is just as, you know, formative and significant as the other, but you're just giving them that, that element of choice, which is really, really important. Um, Okay. So we are ready to wrap up Monica, but I wanted to give the the floor just to you uh, just to kind of send a message to the community. And if there's anything that you wanted to promote or talk about, uh, 
now's the time. <laughs> well, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone for carving out time to spend with me today. I know everyone's in different time zones and joining from all over different places. So, so appreciate your time and your energy and your participation and your enthusiasm around this topic. So thank you all so much for joining. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your time this week and please stay connected. Feel free to send a message on Instagram, say, Hey, I saw you today or on Twitter, or of course, explore the blog for some more of my favorite resources. Thank you so much, Monica. Honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure listening to you today. And I know that the, uh, uh, our attendees and everybody who's going to be watching this video uh, in the future uh, has, has you know, picked up a wealth of knowledge. And I think that people are really excited to start that curation journey. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, we will be sharing so much more information uh, about this particular session um, further down the line. But in the meantime, I know that many of you have mentioned your certificate for the session. Uh, that, the link to that will be shared in the chat shortly. Uh, and please, tweet out your feedback uh, for this session using the hashtag uh, Wakelet Community Week. Uh, anything that you got from this session, any, any ideas, uh, any inspiration, any feedback that you have, tweet it out because we have a huge competition where you'll be able to win either some Wakelet swag, uh, some iPads, and then like a all expenses paid trip to ISTE 2023, which is nuts, but that's on the line. So, so please share, share your feedback, your screenshots using that hashtag. Thank you so much, Monica, and thank you to everybody who's joined us today. It has been an absolutely thrilling experience speaking to you and, uh, and putting this show on for everyone. Thank you.